How many of us ever uh, allowed something or someone to infuriate us? We, we turned into a raging inferno. You know, maybe some fool uh, did something to us or some fool said something about us. And, and the next thing you know is we're ready to punch, we're ready to roll, we're ready to get bloody. Uh, you know, maybe you women would say, I'm ready to scratch her eyeballs out or pull her hair out. Have you ever been there? Yeah, I think most of us, if we were honest, would, would say that we have. Uh, I have a friend, and he was telling me of a, of a situation with some road rage he was having one time. He was, he was participating with another person in road rage, and, uh, and he actually stopped and uh, took out a hammer and uh, went back and explained the way to this fool more perfectly. <laughs> and in another situation, the same person was telling me, that one time this guy was pulling up behind him, flashing lights, and just giving him the brights, you know, right in his mirror. And so he happened to have a pistol, just happened to have a pistol laying beside him. And he pulled it up and kind of waved it in the, <laughs> you know, and the fool left him, left him alone. Uh, but, you know, I think that, uh, I think we can all relate to that at, at some point in time. How many, how many of you relate to that? That at some place in time you allowed something or someone, some fool doing something to you or, 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 or saying something about you, you let, let it get to you and you lost it. Yeah. <laughs> okay, that's nearly all of us but Joe. Now Joe, I didn't see you raise your hand. Okay, he did it like this. Alright, now here's my question for today and here's the thought is uh child of God, I'm asking you, who's the fool? Is it that fool that you were <laughs> angry with, or were you the fool in how you responded? Uh -huh. This is what we're going to be talking about today. Now, now David, in our, in, our, in our study with David, David has been living in the wilderness. It's actually an oasis. We, we look at it in a bad way. It's, it, it's, it's in Gedi. It's this oasis place that he's got here, and it's his stronghold. And he's living in this place, and it's a, it's a beautiful place. But what David has sort of become in these years is a Robin Hood. Now, if, if you remember correctly, the reason that the people wanted a king was because of the lawlessness. There were all of these raiding parties and all these gangs, and they were going out and killing and stealing. They were going out and terrorizing all the people. And so the people said, give us a king like the other nations so we can have some peace. We can have some law around here. Well, so they elected Saul, as you remember, but Saul did nothing for that. In fact, he actually made it worse. But now David was actually doing what the people wanted done. In this whole area of Judea, here is, here is David out here doing exactly what the people needed. And he has this great name going on. You know, he's like Robin Hood. You know, everybody knows him. He's doing this, this great thing. And, and he was protecting people. And, and those that would benefit the most from his protection, of course, were the wealthy. And one of these wealthy people was named Nabal. So we want to look at Nabal and Abigail and David today in this aspect of conflict. So let me read this to you. It's in 1 Samuel chapter 25, verse 2. It says, A certain man of man who had property there at Carmel was very wealthy. How wealthy? Is, is, Na, is Naboth very wealthy, very wealthy. He had a thousand goats, Nabal I meant, he had a thousand goats and 3,000 sheep, which he was shearing, it's sheep shearing time, I'm going to talk about that in just a second, which he was shearing in Carmel. His name was Nabal, and his wife's name was Abigail. She was an intelligent and beautiful woman. In other words, she was beautiful inwardly and outwardly. Brains and beauty. But, contrasting that, but her husband, a Calebite, was surly <laughs> and mean to his, in his dealings. Now, let me show you this. This word surly is, is the Hebrew word quasheth, and what it means is severe. He, he wasn't just mean, he was severely mean. He just didn't do people bad. He severely did them bad. He was severely, <laughs> he was severely surly. And, and, and his name, Nabal, comes from a Hebrew word with the root of Nabal. And what it means is stupid, wicked, especially impious, 
a fool, and a vile person. Now, what you need to realize is that in the Bible, a fool is not just some simple-minded person who does silly things. Here's what a fool is, the biblical definition in Psalms 14.1. It says, the fool says in his or her heart, there is no God. It's all about me. There's nothing about God here, it's just me. There is no God, so it's got to be about me. They are corrupt and their deeds are vile. Now this Nabal, Nabal is wealthy, very wealthy, but he's also stupid. Nabal is a fool. Nabal, Nabal treats people badly. He, he treats them severely badly. And this is the guy, Nabal. <laughs> and Nabal goes through life saying, life is all about me. There is no God. Now, Nabal was one of these people that David was protecting, and David was doing a very good job of it. Here's what the people that, were, that were, had seen David operate, here's what they had to say about the job that this David or Robin Hood was sort of doing. 1 Samuel 25, 15. It says here, Yet these men, speaking of David's men, were very good to us. They did not mistreat us. And the whole time we were out in the fields near them, nothing was missing. They didn't steal from us. They treated us well. Night and day, they were a wall around us all the time. We were herding our sheep near them. They were protecting us. They were like a wall all around us. David did a great job with Nabal, Nabal and his servants and his stuff, and, 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 but Nabal didn't appreciate it. Now, let me explain this to you. It's sheep shearing time, and so it's time now to, to celebrate. Now, 1 Samuel 25.4 says, while David was in the desert, and it's really just an oasis is where he's at in, in En Gedi. Well, in the desert, he heard that Nabal was shearing sheep. So he sent ten young men and said to them, Go up to Nabal at Carmel and greet him in my name. Now let me explain this to you just a little bit. Sheep shearing time was a big time. Uh, and all the farmers who had sheep would, would proclaim a time when they were going to shear their sheep. So all the other farmers and all the other servants, everybody would get together so that all the sheep could get sheared. Nabal had 3,000 sheep. It would take lots of people to do this. So they would have these big parties, and everybody would come. All the neighbors were invited. Everybody all around was invited. Uh, they would have, after they sheared the sheep, they would have this big party, this big blast, this big blowout. Come on, come all. Everybody was coming. Now, obviously, David had participated in some of these sheep shearing, and he felt like he was invited as well. Obviously, he'd been to some others, so surely Nabal wants him to come as well. So what David is doing, is says, hey, listen, instead of imposing on you with 600 people, why don't you just send me something? Just whatever you want to send me. We want to celebrate your fortune along with you. And just send me whatever. I can't expect you to feed 600 of us, but hey, just, just feed me. And he thought that was, that was acceptable. So he sends, he sends the, the, his ten guys to, to, to Nabal. Now let me show you what, what Nabal has to say. In 1 Samuel 25, 10, Nabal answered David's servants, <laughs> who, who is David? Who is the son of Jesse? <laughs> Many servants are breaking away from their masters these days. Now this is a direct cut and, and a direct a hit on David because of what was going on between David and Saul. And he's, 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 he's purposefully um, demeaning David. Many, many people are running away from their servants and their, master, their masters these days. Why should I, now watch this, why should I take my bread and water and the meat I have strengthened for my shearers and give it to men coming from who, who knows where? I ain't giving you guys nothing. <laughs> you know, and I want you to see is that Nabal was all about Nabal. It was I, my, me. It was all about him. Nabal's world revolved not around God, not around anyone else. It was just about Nabal. Uh, but you know what, what I really want us to see here is, Nabal, you're not thinking very well here, buddy. Uh, you know, you're a farmer. You maybe got 30, 40 people there. Uh, you're belittling this guy who has 600 warriors. He can take your head off. Your people skills aren't real good here, Nabal. Uh, you know, I, I think Nabal got his people skills from, uh, from the zoo. <laughs> he treated people like, like animals. How, how many of you know Nabals? Uh, there, there are people that belittle people. They, they insult people. Uh, they demean people. 
How many of you have ever known a Nabal? It's just about all of us. It's good. Let me ask you this now. How many of you have been Nabal? <laughs> some, some of you shot. That's good. That's good. <laughs> me too. Me too. And this isn't good. And this is what the story is unfolding to us here. Nabal purposefully insulted David. He did this on purpose. He knew who David was. Everybody in the whole region knew who David was. Six, you don't run around with 600 people and people not know who you are. He's everybody. He knew who Jesse was, lived in the same area with Jesse. He, he knew all about David. And he's just cutting and he's on purpose, purposefully putting David down, insulting him. Now here's what I want to say. Be cautious whom you belittle. Be, be careful with your insults because, number one, they're going to get back to the person you're insulting. David's guys couldn't wait to get to David. But number two, we don't think it. But God takes this extremely serious. Extremely serious. So when David heard what Nabal had said, watch. 1 Samuel 25, 13. David said, strap on your swords. And they all strapped on their swords. David and his men and set out 400 of them. 200 stayed behind. I guess David said, I just need 400. 400 of them and, and, and 200 stayed behind to guard the camp. Meanwhile, thank God for meanwhiles. Now, now David's having a moment. We're going to deal with this. But I thank God that while I'm having a testosterone moment, God is doing meanwhile. While, while I'm about to lose it and do something very stupid, God is doing meanwhile. Meanwhile, one of the young shepherds told Abigail, Nabal's wife, what had happened. David sent, David sent messengers from the back country to salute our master, but he tore into them with insults. And so David said, <laughs> now watch this, these, these things we say when we've lost it. He says, he says, may God do his worst to me if Nabal and every cur in his misbegotten brood isn't dead meat by morning. <laughs> David, come on, just Nabal said this. You got a lot of innocent people here. You're going to kill kids, you're going to kill innocent people. David Come on. David's having a testosterone moment. He, he, he's lost it. Now listen, here's what I want us to see. Is David is the man after what? God's own heart. D David is the anointed of the Lord, the selected. D David is going to be the next king, but yet he's, he's lost it. He's gone all over the edge. <laughs> he swords up 400 men to take out a farmer. Meanwhile, Abigail, brains and beauty. Meanwhile, Abigail goes to work. Now, what I want to talk about today is when we, children of God, anointed of the Lord, those of us who are serious Christ followers, when we lose it, not if, we, we all voted a while ago, and, and we all voted that we do have a tendency to sometimes lose it. When we lose it, how do we handle it? What is the way that somebody that's after God's own heart, how do they handle conflict? So let's learn how God dealt with David and what David did in response to how God dealt with him. Okay? So I want to give you three things. I think these are important to us. So when we lose it, maybe some of this will come back to us. Okay? When we lose it, number one, wait for wisdom. Would you say that back to me? Wait for wisdom. Say it. Wait for wisdom. <laughs> Most of the time, nearly all the time, uh, when, when we're in a serious, when we're in a serious, emotional, uh, heated, personal conflict, we don't use wisdom. <laughs> David, the man after God's own heart, didn't use wisdom. He didn't pray. He didn't wait. He didn't calm down. He began to blast out of his mouth these irrational statements. I'm just going to kill them all. And he could have done it and would have done it. You move into this testosterone thing, you know. This, this, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get them. I'm gonna get vengeance. 
his testosterone got the best of him. Now, we've all experienced, as we voted a while ago, we've all experienced something along those lines, and especially us who are full of testosterone, or maybe we could even say cursed with, with, with testosterone. <laughs> it's a rush. Now, you guys listen and see if I'm telling you the truth. Uh, it's a rush, and it gets in you, and then your heart starts pounding and beating, and, 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 and your eyes narrow, and your nostrils flare, and your fists clench, and, and, and you're, ready, you're ready to go, go at it, you know? <laughs> you're having this moment. Thoughts and words come up into your mind and out of your mouth that you didn't even know existed in you. And you can't get them back. And they're out there now. And, and, and you, you regret ever saying them, much, I mean, ever thinking them, much less ever saying them. You've, you've said these irrational things. And let me tell you guys a secret. It doesn't get better with age, and it doesn't get fixed with salvation. All right, guys, let's, let's, how many of you guys recognize the, the testosterone? If you're a guy and you're proud to be a man, give me a hoo, 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 come on. Be proud to be a man. That testosterone is there for a reason, but it's not to kill somebody. <laughs> now, if you recognize that testosterone rush, how many of you would admit that that testosterone rush has also made you a fool? <laughs> it will it'll make you a fool. I remember, and this is nearly going on 30 years ago now. Uh, I was working, and I was saved, man. I was seeking God hard. I was chasing Him bad. I was, I was taking courses to get my degrees and, and, and just so I could, I could be a preacher, you know, and doing the stuff I was supposed to do. I was praying every day, hours a day. I was studying. I was reading His Word. I was ministering to people, teaching in Sunday school class. And I was at work. And, uh, and, and my boss's boss jumped me. And he began to belittle me and demean me and hurl insults at me in front of not only my boss, but also my employees right out on the floor. And he began to blast me. And I did pretty good for about five minutes. And I was, you know, I was letting him just go. And, I'm, you know, he wouldn't reason with me. He wouldn't talk. He was just going, red-faced and all this. When I started getting red-faced, too, and, 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 you know, you feel it. Boom, boom. You feel hard. And I found myself, I was facing him like this. I found myself turning like this, squaring up. I found my teeth gritting, fist clenching. And I was that close. I had picked a spot on that guy's face <laughs> right here. I was going to hit him right here. I was going to break his nose and put his eye out at the same punch. He was not going to get up. There wasn't going to be a fight. There was going to be no more punches. He was going down. <laughs> no, no, man. No, man. <laughs> and I was that far. I mean, it, 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 it couldn't have been more than a second that I was going to let it go. I was going to give him a hard right. And he turned and walked off. I guess he saw that I had crossed the tes tes testosterone line. And he walked off. And when I realized how close... I was to being a Nabal fool. It bothered me. I'm a child of God. But do you think that that stopped me from ever doing it again? Oh, <laughs> I wished I could tell you it had, but it didn't. My most embarrassing moment in my whole life came from a testosterone rush. And at that time, I'm a preacher. It doesn't go away with age. A and it doesn't go away with salvation. You can be a man or a woman after God's own heart and still be a Nabal fool. I've been on the other side of that rush as well. I'll tell you a story. Judy and I were coming back from Chattanooga. We got off at the Lafayette Ringgold exit and we were coming down uh, the highway there right, right at, the, at the first light as I remember uh, and we pulled up behind a car before you get to the food line. And the car in front of us stopped at the light, and we were sitting there, and there was an elderly man and a woman in the car. Now, when I say elderly now, <laughs> I mean elderly. Uh, it used to be elderly was 30, and then elderly was 50. Well, at this particular time, I'm about 58, so elderly is really elderly now. Elderly is like in the late 70s, this guy, and, and this woman in the car with him. And we pull up behind the car, and the light's there, and 
and the light turns green. And he doesn't move. He's not paying attention. He's uh, talking and he's looking in the floor and moving around. So we're sitting there. We sat there for a good long little while, I thought. And, and uh, you know, and so I said, this light's going to change again and we're going to be still sitting here. And so I, I didn't... Anybody ever done that? You know, you just weren't paying attention and the light changes on you. Well, I didn't, I didn't, you know, I didn't sit down and blast the guy with a horn. I just gave him a little toot, you know, just a friendly honk. And just to let him know the light was changed. Well, I've had been done that way before and I, I'm apologetic. You know, I'm, I'm so, sorry, I'm sorry. I wasn't paying attention and I'll scoot it and get out of the way and hopefully they can make up the time I've cost them. So anyway, that's what I did, but that's not what my guy did. My guy went bonkers on me, man. And he, he was trying to twist around in the seat, but he was too old and too stiff, and he couldn't get around, you know. And he was, he was trying to shake us, so he started taking it out on the mirror. He had his fist going on in the mirror. He was cussing me in the mirror. He was punching me in the mirror. <laughs> he was going after me, giving me all kind of sign language with his fingers in the mirror. He was just going for it, man. I'm telling you. It was, I, I mean, Judy and I looking at this guy, and we're saying, hey, fool, you know. <laughs> Well, finally, he takes off and he floorboards it, runs up about 100 feet and pulls over right there at the food line. And, and so we come on through there, you know. Well, now he's got his window down, his head's out the window, and he's shaking his fist at me, cussing me, challenging me to fight. Well, I, I, I see, I pretend I don't and just keep on driving, you know. Well, <laughs> we get down the road several miles, and Judy finally asked me, she said, uh, when, when she's sure that I won't turn around and go back, and she's looked back a couple times to make sure he's not behind us, and, and, and she asked me, she says, uh, she says, did you see that guy pull over up there? And I said, yeah, of course I did. And she said, I said, but what good is it going to do me to, to debate with this guy? I said, he's not going to reason. He's going to make me do something I shouldn't do. I said, why, why give that any, any space? She looks at me and she says, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I think she finally thought that I had grown up past the testosterone rush. And I wish that were true. I just got past that moment. But, but, but the thing was, you know, I, you know, she's done that so many times. She's had to put up with so many of my testosterone rushes and be an Abigail for me. Now, let me, speaking of Abigail, let me show you how this plays out. <clears throat> uh, what's going on now is uh, David's on his way to wipe Nabal off the face of the planet. And as temper's flaring and dust is flying, and he's on the trail heading for Nabal, and it's like a locker room filled with sweat and testosterone, there's this whiff of perfume. And what, Na what, what Abigail is doing is, Abigail is standing in David's trail. I'm a poet, and I know it. Okay? Abigail is standing in David's trail. What she's done is she's heard David's coming. And so she went and she prepared all of this food, loaded it up on all of these donkeys and, and brought them. And there's waiting there for David. So Abigail is standing there in David's trail. Now, I've, I've got a book. It's by Max Licato. And maybe, maybe some of you have read some of his works. It's really good. But anyway, he's, I've got the book on Facing Your Giants. And this, of course, about David. And so I want to read this little excerpt to you from, uh, from the book. It says, 400 men rein in their rides. Some gape at the food, others gawk at the female. She's good looking with good cooking, a combination that stops any army. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> Abigail speaks to David with such tremendous wisdom. Finally, wisdom. Six times, Abigail re references herself as your maidservant. Eight times, she references David as my Lord. And what she does in this, in this thing where she talks, and the Bible gives it a lot of space as to what she said, is it's that important. What she, what she causes and forces David to do is to see who David really is. She says, David, this isn't who you are. You're the anointed of the Lord. You're going to be the next king over all of Israel. You're going to be the prince of all God's people. This isn't who you are. You're not a guy who goes around killing Nabals. He's just a fool. You're better than that. And David, is this, is this, is this really the right thing to do? Come on, David. You know, he's, he's, he's really not that important here. Why are you letting yourself get all worked up over this? And by the way, David, it's probably my fault anyway. You know, don't you like that? 
it, how could it be her fault? But she says, it's probably my fault anyway. Had I been out there with, if I'd been with Nabal, maybe like I should have been, maybe I could have helped him give you the right response. And after she said that, making David remember who he was and what he was really there to do and what he was really about, she says this. Read this to you. First, first Samuel 25, 30, it says, when God completes... She sees, she's seeing God in this. When God completes all the goodness he has promised my master, speaking of David, my master, and sets you up as prince over Israel, my master will not have this de dead weight in his heart of guilt of an avenging murder. I want to make sure we get this. Leave this up there. You won't have this dead weight in his heart, the guilt of an avenging murder. I want you to see this. Vengeance is a dead weight in your heart. Vengeance isn't good. Vengeance haunts you. You think, why did I say that? Why did I do that? Why did I hurt this person? Yeah, I know they said this about me. But... He goes, she goes on and she says, and when God has worked things for good. God's working here, David. I want you to realize that when you go into these times of conflict, God's working. And when God has worked things for good for my master, remember me. Remember, David, I gave you some wisdom. Remember, David, that I, that I helped you through this time. What I want us to see is that finally... Some wisdom came in, into the conflict, into the situation. And I want to say something, and I hope you remember it, because conflict changes when wisdom is used. Conflict changes when you bring wisdom into it. What, what, what wisdom will cause you to do is remember who you are. Are you this little? Are you this small? What, what, what wisdom will do is remind you of the consequences. There are always consequences to conflict. And most of them are bad. And so what wisdom does is start reminding you of what's going to happen if you do this. What, what, what wisdom do is cause you to realize that you're giving a bad response will haunt you. It's a dead weight in your heart. So Abigail brought to the table wisdom. Thank God for meanwhiles. Thank God for Abigail's. Thank God that sometimes in our testosterone rushes and our times when we women want to claw out eyes and pull out hair, God is doing something, bringing somebody in your trail to bring you wisdom. Wait for wisdom. The second thing that we need to do is handle each conflict separately by selecting your battles. Now, I want to explain this. You see, we don't need to fight every conflict. Uh, like yesterday, last week we talked about this, but yesterday David was full of patience. David, it was amazing how you, you let Saul come in into your home and make a mess right there in your floor, right where you eat, right where you sleep. You, you let him come in there, and, and, and everybody around you was telling you to kill him. But you had such patience then, David, you didn't, you didn't do it. But David, you handled that like a man of God. But today, David... <laughs> Nabal's just said something about you. He just humiliated you, said some things about you, wouldn't let you come to his party and wouldn't give you some food, and you want to kill him? You see, we don't, we don't get patience on credit. We, don't you wish you could? Don't you, man, I need some, let me get my credit card, my, my patience card out. I need a little patience here and swipe the card and get some patience. It doesn't work that way. Every day is different. Every conflict is different. You are going to handle this conflict different than you handled that conflict. And all conflicts don't need to become battles. Most of them, in fact, aren't worth fighting. What, what Abigail was able to do was help David understand this. You know, I look at my life and sometimes I handle my testosterone moments. I, I amaze myself how, how patient and how wise I am. And then there's sometimes <laughs> I become a testosterone fool. Now I want you to stop and think. You know, David, can you justify killing Nabal, killing all these people because he wouldn't let you come to his party, he wouldn't give you some food, and he said some bad things about you? Well, whoopee-doo. 
Welcome to the party. Welcome to life, David. Somebody said something about you. Can you justify slicing somebody up, killing somebody because they said this about you? Pretty lame, David. Pretty lame. You're going to wipe him out, wipe his family out, wipe all these people out because he said something about you? Pretty lame. But then when you think about it, most of the things, most of the conflicts that we get in are pretty lame. They really don't mean squat. What does this guy really mean to me, mean to my life, that's caused me to get so infuriated and have road rage? What really does it play in my life if somebody says something negative about me? In the big scene, am I not bigger than that? Am I that little? Pretty lame, Delbert. And when I look back at most of my conflicts, they're pretty lame. And what we've got to learn to do is pick our fights. Pick our fights. Is it worth the time? Is it worth the effort? Is it worth the embarrassment? Most times not. Uh, got to think. 1 Samuel 25, 32 says, David said to Abigail, thank you. David said to Abigail, Praise be the Lord, the God of Israel. Look at this. Who has sent you today to meet me? Thank you. Thank you for doing what God told you to do. <laughs> David realized that Abigail's intervention was of God. Has something like that ever happened to you? Have, uh, has there been some Abigail come in your life and stopped you from making a fool of yourself? You know, I can't, I can't tell you the times that she's done that for me. She put her beauty and her brains to work and st stood in my trail and says, Delbert, think, calm down. It's not worth it, man. Do you really want to do this? Nah. <laughs> Thank God. Who's your Abigail? Who, who comes to you with wisdom and helps you think and helps you pick your fights? Who's your Abigail? First thing that Abigail brought to the table was cause David to get some wisdom you had to wait on wisdom. Wait till you get somebody in there to give you some wisdom. Number two, second thing that Abigail brought to the table was help David pick his fights. Realize that patience isn't the same every day and that we don't need to fight every conflict we get in. The third thing Abigail helped David do was wait and let God take care of it. <laughs> you know, when, we get, when we get into these situations and, and our mind and our flesh is yelling, punch, scratch, cuss, yell louder, say worse things than they're saying about you. When we get in, into these times, it's hard to wait on God. It, it really is. It's hard for any of us, even a man after God's own heart. It, it's, it's tough. And, and our flesh is yelling, hit, punch, yell, scream, fight. But if we stop and ask our spirit what we should do, what will we hear? Wait. Wait. Don't say anything. Wait. Don't do anything. Wait. Let God take care of this for you. <laughs> and if you'll wait, the situation might not change. But you might. You might decide it's not worth fighting. This isn't worth it. The situation might not change, but you might, and you will never, ever regret waiting. You can punch him or her tomorrow, but wait right now. And if you will wait, you will find that God will take care of it. It's a promise to you. It's a promise in the Word of God that God will take care of it for you. Let me read it to you. Romans chapter 12, verse 19. Do not take revenge, my friends, but leave room for God's wrath. you got to read that back to me. Re leave room for what? God's wrath? I was talking to somebody this morning, and they were talking to me you know, about some of the lessons that we've been talking about. And, he's, and he said to me, you know, he says, I've learned that if I won't get into it, yeah, I might want to do some things to him, but what God's going to do to him is a whole lot worse than what I would do. Leave room for God's wrath. <laughs> it says, uh, I lost my, leave room for God's wrath. Uh, uh, for it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay. I'm, I'll take care of it for you. 
I'll, I'll, rep- I'll take care of this for you. I will repay, says the Lord. <laughs> it's amazing. And David did it. David did exactly what Abigail asked him to do. He went home. He went back to the strongholds with food for his belly and Abigail for his mind. Abigail went back home to a drunken fool, Nabal. I'll read it to you. 1 Samuel 25, 36. When Abigail went to Nabal, he was in the house holding a banquet like that of a king. He was in high spirits and very drunk. How drunk is he? Very drunk. Is that wise? Very drunk. So she told him nothing until daybreak. Then in the morning when Nabal was sober, his wife, Abigail, told him all these things. Told him everything that had taken place with David. And watch now. And his heart failed him. He had a heart attack. And he became like a stone, went into a coma, had a stroke. And about 10 days later, the Lord struck Nabal. And he died. Whoa. We have tremendous problems with verses like this. But I don't care how you slice it or dice it. I don't care how you manipulate it. The bottom line is this. Treat God's people right. Don't mess with God's people. If you can ever make yourself do one thing, make yourself treat people right. How do you do that, Delbert? Well, here's what Jesus said. Here's his, his, wraps it all up right here. Jesus says this in Luke 6, 31. He says, do to others, read it to me, as you would have them do to you. Sums it up. Nabal didn't do that. Nabal was scurry. Nabal was mean to people. Nabal was insulting and demeaning. Nabal had a heart attack, went to a coma. And ten days after he said those belittling, humiliating, insulting things to David, he dies. Is that a coincidence? David didn't think so. Let me show you what David said about it. 1 Samuel 25, 39. When David heard that Nabal was dead, he said, David said, Hallelujah. Blessed be God who has stood up for me. What's David saying? God did that for me. That doesn't work in my theology. God did that for me against Nabal's insults. God also, now I do get this part, God (laughs) kept me from an evil act. And there we go again. And God let Nabal's evil boomerang back on him. I'll read you this from the King James Version. It says this in the King James Version. For the Lord hath returned, boomeranged, the wickedness of Nabal upon his own head. (laughs) David said, God took care of Nabal for me. That seems a little severe. Yeah, I agree. He, he, He said some bad things about David. He belittled David. He humiliated David before his people. Yeah, I agree. He didn't let David come to his party. And, 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 well, you know, whoopee-doo. It's not that big of a deal. God wiped us all out that did these kinds of things. Whoa. It seems severe, God. But you forget, you see, Nabal's a fool. Nabal says in his heart, there is no God. He's a vile person. Nabal treated everybody bad. Nabal's life was all about Nabal. Nabal was wicked. Nabal was mean. Nabal was evil. Nabal was a bad person. And it wasn't just for David that God was settling the score with. It was was because of the score and how Nabal did everybody, everybody, that God was settling the score with Nabal. points are these. Be cautious what you say. Be cautious what you do when it comes to people. 
Watch your insult. Watch your words. Watch your actions. Why? Because they're a boomerang. And they're going to come back on your head. But more important, see, we don't see this as that important to God. It's extremely important to God. How you treat people is probably the most important thing you'll ever do as far as God is concerned. So, finish this up. 1 Samuel 25, 39. Nabal's not even cold yet. Then David sent word to Abigail asking her to become his wife. <laughs> Man of the God's own heart. I mean, that, you know, it's... it's it, I could say so much, I'll just leave that alone. <laughs> and what Abigail, now very wealthy widow, <laughs> what Abigail does is love, pack it all up and go to David. What have we learned today? What have we learned today? We've learned that a man or a woman, even a man or a woman after God's own heart, seriously seeking God, trying to do God's will, anointed of the Lord, can lose it, can be infuriated to the point of wanting to actually kill somebody. However, if he or she will, number one, wait for wisdom and let somebody come along and help you through this. Number two, decide you don't have to fight every conflict. Every conflict that you're going to have in life is not worth fighting. Pick your fights. And realize that if you'll do this, then, then you're going to have wisdom tell you who you really are. And wisdom remind you of the consequences. And wisdom help you through this stuff. And then number three, if you'll wait on God, which is the hardest thing to do. God will take care of it for you. And you won't have to. And if you'll do those kinds of things, then you'll save your reputation. You'll, you'll, you'll maintain your own sanity. You won't go bonkers. You won't defile your own reputation. You're going to have a great life. You're going to make better decisions because you're going to be using wisdom and people and waiting on God to help you through these things. You're going to make great decisions in life. You're going to take a step closer to coming into your kingdom. And you'll become a man or a woman after God's own heart. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this wonderful, wonderful story of David. Thank you, Lord, for showing us that this great man had great faults, just like the rest of us. But still, we can have faults and still love you. Father, I pray for us now. I want your heads bowed and your eyes closed. Talk to you just a second. How many of you would, would, would agree with me in this is that sometimes you handle conflict so well, you amaze yourself, but then there's other times when you're just a fool. And, and you really need the Lord to help you here. You really need the Lord to remind you every time just about that you need to, you need to wait on wisdom you, you need to pick your fights and, and you really need to let God handle this if that's you and you would say you know I really need some help in this area would you along with me raise your hand and say yeah let's all pray together I see hands hands everywhere yeah father help us Lord help us by your spirit wait on wisdom help us by your spirit pick our fights help us Lord by your spirit to wait on God and let him take care of it for us. Help us. We release the spirit within each of us now to do this. Heads bowed and eyes closed. Now maybe you would say, you know, I am not where I need to be with God. My life is one conflict after another. I'm just one fool after another fool. I handle things so badly. Well, the reason that's happening is because you're not sensitive to the spirit of God. You've gotten away from God. You're not where you need to be with God. And what you need to do is turn around, repent, that's what that word means, and get closer to God, get back to where you need to be with the Lord. Now, now life is not going to get better, it's going to get worse, and you're going to end up hurting somebody and hurting yourself. And God wants to help you here. God wants to help you. He wants to bring you into the kingdom of God and minister to you life so that you can have a great life. You can come into your kingdom. You can become what God's intended you to become. Or maybe you've gotten away from God or maybe never received the Lord as your Lord and your Savior. But now you see, you know, I really want to fix this. I want to get where I need to be with God. If that's you, right where you're sitting, right where you're sitting, I want to pray for you. I want you just to raise your hand right where you're sitting and let me pray for you. If that's you, would you raise your hand and let me, let me just pray for you. I see a hand here. Any hand back there? Another hand? Three hands? 